but costs, cost of goods sold, went down by much more, from 149.3 to 100, roughly 120 billion. And SG&A also came down by $3 billion. So these are very major uh, cost reductions. And the result of the whole thing was that their earnings before taxes, $27 billion loss in 2008 to a $7.5 billion profit in 2010. Uh, those are not the greatest margins in the world. I'm sure um, you've all seen much higher margins, and their margins today are actually a bit higher than this. But, it's, but they were positive, even in a year when car sales had not recovered. And they made, pro and they made money for the first time since 2004. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the, so it actually worked. And then if you take a, a cut at it from a different side and you look at um, how, what we projected was going to happen versus what, was actually, what actually happened in 2010, so as I mentioned, we were very conservative in our projections about car sales. We did not want to assume a major recovery. So we assumed 10.9. They actually came out at 11.6. We assumed, again, very conservatively, that GM's market share would only be 18.5%, which was uh, at the low end of what they'd been doing historically. They actually got to 19.1%. And so those, the math between those two numbers gets you actually a 10% higher volume than what we expected, 2.2 million cars versus 2.0. But here's another huge difference. This is the average price, that, what they call the ATP, the average transaction price, what they actually realized on selling a car. And so once we changed labor from being a fixed cost to being a variable cost and got them focused on profits instead of volume, all those incentives, a lot of those, those special deals of the $2,000 off and all the stuff that you've seen went down dramatically. And so their average transaction price went up. And this is essentially profit. There are no real costs associated with that. And so that drops to the bottom line. And so there, and this was much more than we imagined. We really tried to be very conservative, and they came in way above our expectations. And so again, when you just sort of combine all these different numbers, their revenues were actually $13 billion more than we thought they were going to be. And their EBITDA, which is a form of EBITDA, was roughly double what we thought it would be, and their margins were higher. So we did a business plan. We did a set of um, assumptions. And they came in uh, above all of them. And even since then, uh, they've continued to make progress and are still, as you, if you saw in the paper today, even Dan Ackerson gave an interview. And they're really doing great. Uh, and they have a whole set of new products coming out. The other piece of what we did was to optimize the capital structure. As I said, GM had way too many fixed obligations. This is a cyclical industry. It cannot operate with high levels of leverage. It needs to have liquidity to get itself through the inevitable troughs. And if you look at the, uh, at the foreign companies, you'll see that they had, and I'll show you that in just a second, you'll see that they had uh, very different balance sheets than General Motors did. And so it had to get down to a, a level of debt that worked. And part of the consequence of being over leveraged had been that they could not invest in new products. And so they were in this downward spiral that they had too much debt. They didn't have the liquidity to invest in new products. So they didn't do very well. That meant they had more debt. And they were just, they were in a death spiral. And it, had, and it had to stop. And part of the restructuring was it did. So if you look at the balance sheet, what happened was, uh, using the bankruptcy process, which as I said, I'm not going to go into detail about today, uh, the debt went from $46 billion down to $4.6. We put some preferreds in place. We made sure they had an ample cash reserve. We did not want to see them short of liquidity again. And so they went, in terms of debt, from $30 billion of debt to actually 15 billion of net cash. And then because of the changes we made in the uh, union obligations and in the pension obligations and in the healthcare obligations, that number went down by another $23 billion. So their total kind of fixed obligations that they had on their balance sheet went from $87 billion down to $18 billion and put them in a position where they could actually compete. And as I said, they have done so very successfully. So let me just conclude with uh, what I think hopefully you've already divined from what I've had to say in terms of lessons learned from the GM and, for that matter, the whole auto experience. The first is, and you've heard this a lot today, and I'm sure it's uh, one of the major themes you'll hear the rest of the day, is this relentless focus on profitability that just was absent there. That you've got to constantly, uh, in, a, in a highly competitive cyclical industry, you've got to relentlessly focus on your costs. Secondly, as I indicated, GM was terrible at capital allocation. They, had, they would literally show up at the board and say, we want to spend $2 billion to develop a new engine. 
And the board will say, well, what's the return on that investment? And they would say, well, we don't really think about it that way. We just need a new engine, so we're going to spend $2 billion to build, to develop it and build a plant to make it. And they just had no real concept of how you uh, look at return on investment or capital allocation. And then I mentioned uh, the importance of liquidity and uh, being able to manage your business through a down cycle when you're in an industry like autos where there inevitably will be ups and downs. And then finally, uh, you'll, at the, you have to remember that at the end of all this, it's about the product, that if you don't make good products, none of the rest of this matters. And these companies had become uh, so distracted by their financial problems and their cost problems and everything else they had to worry about, and they were so limited by their liquidity problems that the quality of the product suffered, and, they would, and the, the quality of the finishes would go down, the designs weren't refreshed as often as they should have been, they simply didn't have the resources to develop new models, and so they ended up with second-class products and the kind of market share results that you saw. And so what you have to remember in running a business is at the end of it, if you don't produce the best product, none of the rest of the stuff matters. So with that, let me thank you all for your time and attention and look forward to talking to you more after lunch.